Today I want to talk about a somewhat crazy question uh, when we're building systems, which is what would it mean if we designed computer systems to handle the absolute worst case scenarios? So for instance, if you were provisioning a cluster of distributed services, let's say you're provisioning hardware for your startup, very reasonably you're going to need to reason about questions like how bad is our load going to be in a worst case scenario? And if we take this question to an extreme, like what is the absolute worst case our, our service might be up against? You know, in the worst case, if you're, if, you're, if you're essentially building an internet service, you might have to handle 7.3 billion simultaneous users. That is everyone on planet Earth logging to your site at once. Now, you could probably buy enough hardware to service 7.3 three billion users simultaneously accessing your service. But in all likelihood, in fact, for probably every application today, even Facebook, right, we're going to end up with a bunch of idle resources if we, in fact, provision for this crazy absolute load. Now, similarly, if we're trying to build hardware, this laptop here is actually built for, you know, I, I, I put this laptop through a fair bit of abuse. In reality, right, if we want to ask, well, you know, how could we build a piece of hardware that could withstand sort of absolute worst case environmental conditions, we might say, well, what would it take to put this laptop on something like the Mars rover? Well, in fact, a bunch of people actually do build chips and do build hardware for sort of interstellar space travel. And the, and the fact of the matter is, if you want to build chips that survive in space, it ends up costing hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to protect against things like radiation hitting your chips and bombarding them when you don't have an ozone layer in front of them. So in fact, we could build chips that in fact worked in all of our laptops, that if we sent our laptops to Mars, they would work. But for most of us, right, for the average case sitting here in St. Louis, Missouri on Earth, we'd end up paying a lot more for the packaging that we don't end up using. As a final example, right, we care a lot about security, right? So we hear a lot of security breaches, hackers getting into our systems, and so on. And it's actually a fairly important problem today. But especially when we talk about security, we can get very paranoid, right? So instead of just worrying about people trying to get into our systems, we might worry, well, what happens if suddenly our developer team turns against us? How hard would it be to protect against the possibility that all of our developers are writing malicious code and their binaries are accessing the data and they're leaking this information? Now, this is like a particularly crazy question. It turned out there's actually some really cool research on this topic. But not surprisingly, actually handling this worst case where we're totally paranoid, all my developers are against me, ends up really increasing the cost of both deployment and development of the code. Not surprising, right? The answering, by answering this question, by designing our computer systems for worst case scenarios, we find that frequently designing for the absolute worst case ends up penalizing the average case we end up making trade-offs that essentially hamper our performance when bad things don't actually occur. So in terms of this trade-off, we might visualize this as a graph. If on the y-axis we have our performance in the average case, when everything's going fine and we haven't hit sort of worst case scenarios, if we, the, the, the more and more sort of corner cases that we handle, the more and more we start to penalize ourselves. And this actually happens you know, a, lot of, a lot of the time, for instance, even when we're not building software. For instance, if you're going out for a run, it's a beautiful day in St. Louis today, you're probably going to go out in a short, shorts and a t-shirt. Okay? And that's a very reasonable choice of clothing. right? You're going to be able to move quickly, and you're going to not, not get too hot. Of course, there is some possibility that there's a freak snowstorm that lasts for a year, and you're trapped outside in your short and t-shirts. Your shirt and, and shorts. The problem here is if you really wanted to guard against that worst case scenario, you'd probably have to put on a winter parka, you might have to bring food for the year, might have to bring a portable camping stove. Very reasonably, you'd end up in a situation where you weren't necessarily running outside, but you'd instead be sort of trudging with this sort of doomsday uh, set, of, set of sort of resources, clothing, and so on. So the question is, if this is sort of a dismal trade-off where the more sorts of worst case behaviors and worst case sort of environmental conditions that we want to account for, the worse we perform sort of in the average case when bad things don't happen. In this talk, I want to ask, what would it mean to sort of break this curve, to get the best of both worlds, where by designing for the worst case, we can actually improve the average case as well? This doesn't always apply, but in this talk, I want to highlight when it can apply and what it means for the way in which we build and think about software systems. So in this talk, I'm going to describe basically three major points. I study distributed systems, and so I'm going to spend most of the time talking about distributed systems in the network. 
Essentially, by handling worst case network behavior, we can frequently improve the average case as well. Now, this, this talk title talks about distributed systems. It turns out that over the course of this talk, it turns out there's a couple other instances we found where, in fact, this trade-off isn't really a trade-off at all, where, again, designing for the worst case actually improves the average case. And this has some pretty interesting implications for both sort of general optimization problems and, in fact, sort of human-computer interaction accessible design. And finally, I'll leave you with a few lessons that essentially describe how you can use these type of techniques, this type of think reasoning, not just in your distributed systems, but also when you're building software systems in general. So to kick things off, let's talk about distributed systems in the network. I said in my research, I study distributed systems, and this is because I think distributed systems really matter. So almost every application today that is essentially non-trivial is or is either becoming distributed. So if you want to build a rich application today, there's a good chance you have dependencies on external data sources. You have APIs that you end up uh, requesting when you're building a mashup. You have a large-scale service that's comprised of a large number of microservices, or you have a service-oriented architecture where no one component does all of the different, uh, sort of plays all the different roles in your application. And very realistically, there's some point in your application where you're opening a socket. Now, the core, the core, <laughs> you probably are opening a socket. So what happens when you open a socket, right? What's the, what's the defining characteristic of distributed programs? It's that they operate over a network, right? So in order to actually exchange bits, there's some communication medium across which we're communicating that's more than just, say, invoking a function call. And so the corollary here, given that almost every application is becoming distributed and distribution happens over a network, is that almost every non-trivial application today needs to worry about what happens when we send and when we think about and build systems that operate over the network. So it turns out that networks, as you've, if you've built distributed systems, which I imagine you have, networks actually make designing programs very hard. So a lot of things can go wrong. First off, networks can delay messages or packets. So if I send a message to you, it might very well be the case that in a sort of nicely behaving network, we have a latency of a millisecond or a half millisecond. But as soon as there's, for instance, congestion in the network, and suddenly my top of rack switch starts to buffer packets, my latency can become very unpredictable. It can, it can spike to 10 milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds. And effectively, for modern production systems, we have to imagine the possibility that packets may be delayed arbitrarily long, especially if we're deploying on sort of modern cloud computing infrastructure like Amazon. Now, if we dial up latency or these delays to infinity, we essentially have network failures. So because our networks communicate over physical media, right, over either you know, wires in our data centers or over wireless signals, as we do with you know, your Wi-Fi or your phone, we have to count for the possibility that networks may be unavailable, that packets may be entirely dropped on the floor. In fact, in distributed systems, we can actually capture both of these behaviors in what's sometimes called an asynchronous network model, where I can't tell if I'm missing a message whether the message has been delayed or whether or not it's been lost. And this makes things very challenging. The way in which we'd like to handle this asynchronous network behavior is very simple, which is let's not rely on the network at all. So if we provide what's often known as availability, we can build systems where any replica, any copy of our processes can respond to any request that we send at it. So for instance, if we have two copies of a database server here, the server on the left can respond to requests, and so can the server on the right. And in fact, under this definition of availability, any partitioning of the network, any network behavior that might arise, for instance, if these two servers can't communicate, will still be able to proceed just like normal. Left and right continue to service requests independent of one another. Similarly, if our server on the right, for instance, fails, the server on the left can continue to serve requests it's essentially as if nothing has happened from the perspective of all of the requests on the left-hand side of the partition. So this is a very powerful idea, right? If we can achieve this availability, we, don't, we essentially don't have to worry about network failures. These delays and drops become a non-issue in terms of our system design. Notably, we've been talking about this in terms of failures, right? Where the left server and the right server can no longer communicate. However, this, no, this notion of availability applies also, when these servers can talk. For instance, if our system's available, even when the network is fine, 
we still don't have to exchange messages in order to actually process requests, which is very powerful. In fact, we say that there's no coordination between our servers and our system. So availability addresses this worst case scenario. If we don't have to talk, if, then the network can do whatever it wants and we're fine. However, if we can talk and we have this availability property, we still don't have to talk, right? We don't have to make use of the network. And this leads to several important benefits that correspond to average case benefits. Specifically, if we don't have to talk, if we've built one of these coordination-free systems, first of all, we can scale out our system potentially indefinitely. So if we have two servers here that are, that are servicing the requests, the left server isn't talking to the right server, the right server is not talking to the left server. Fairly straightforward. If I throw more resources at the problem, let's say I provision 100 new EC2 instances of my process, that run my process, all of these new instances can start taking requests without communicating with the, previous, with the previously running servers. This is a pretty huge benefit that we get essentially guaranteed linear scalability just because as we add more servers, they can, continue to, they can start processing requests without affecting load on the rest of the system. In contrast, right, if we were going to have an alternative mechanism, let's say we chose a coordinated mechanism, we elected one of these nodes a primary. Well, any request that would have to go to the primary wouldn't benefit whatsoever from adding these additional resources. This seems almost trivial, but it doesn't come for free. We have to explicitly design for coordination-free execution in order to guarantee that no matter what happens, independent of data layout, independent of request patterns, and so on, we can effectively throw more resources at the problem and get more performance. Now, what I just described here has to do with adding more resources. What about the resources we have? What about making use of all of the hardware that we give a system? Well, if we want to run, say, something like distributed transactions, and here I'm going to show numbers from Amazon EC2, I have eight servers in the system with eight different data items on them, and I want to know how fast can we run transactions or multi-item operations on these servers. We can plot the number of servers we touch per transaction on the x-axis and the throughput, or the number of operations we perform every second, on the y-axis. So when we have one item per transaction, I'm going to touch server A and item A, and then end my transaction. If I have two items per transaction, I'll choose two servers. I might choose B and D, perform my operation on each, and then end my transaction. Not surprisingly, right, if I coordinate while I'm performing these transactions, it can be fairly expensive. If I run something like in-memory locking, where when I want to touch B and D, I grab a lock on B, I grab a lock on D, I perform my operations, then I release the locks, it's going to be fairly slow. In fact, in this coordinated approach, note this is a log scale on the y-axis, we have a huge penalty when we start performing multi-server transactions. Specifically, we have almost a 400x decrease in throughput when Whenever I'm touching B and I'm waiting to go to D, and you come in and you want to and you want to access B, but you have to wait for my lock, it's going to be very slow. Essentially, we're bounded by how quickly we can communicate. Not surprisingly, if we don't use coordination, let's say just say for the purpose of this workload, we don't grab any locks. I'm touching B. I'm waiting to go to D. You come in and you try to touch B. You're allowed to just perform your operations. We run concurrently. Then we don't have this throughput hit at all. You know, when we're touching seven servers per transaction, we have almost three order of magnitude performance gain. Notably even, right, I said this talks about distributed systems, but in fact there are benefits even on a single node sometimes. So when we have one item per transaction, on the far left of this graph, we see the coordination free cases gets better performance, an order of magnitude performance improvement. What's happening here is that we're running this on a, on a server with 16 cores and 32 threads, so 32 hardware threads. And in fact, well, the coordinated case, all the threads queue up on one core waiting for their chance to get the lock. In the coordination-free case, we can make use of all of that parallelism available to us in the hardware. We can actually execute in parallel on all 32 hardware contexts at once. So these coordination-free systems can, in fact, improve throughput, often considerably. And the key idea here is that if I don't have to wait for you, if I can perform my operations independently of what you're doing on the data, then we can each run at the same time. Now, a related concern, related performance related concern, is uh, latency. So given that our, our servers and our processes are actually deployed on, on planet Earth, 
there's an upper bound to how quickly we can communicate. Namely, provided we use sort of standard networking technology, and we don't communicate faster than the speed of light, the maximum throughput we can achieve, or the maximum latency we can achieve, min sorry, sorry, minimum latency we can achieve is around 133 milliseconds for an RGT. So simply to send a message around the equator of planet Earth requires 133 milliseconds. Now, if we get very clever and we try to, for instance, uh, drill through the center of the Earth like high-frequency traders might like us to do, the maximum throughput we can, the maximum, the minimum latency we can achieve is 85 milliseconds. And again, here, right, if we're queuing up all of our requests one after the other, the maximum throughput we can achieve here is on the order of 15 operations per second, even, for, even if we have this hypothetical uh, borehole through the through the core of the planet. This is not very good. So. These coordination-free systems give us these benefits, uh, in, in enabling infinite scale-out, improving throughput by increasing concurrency, and actually ensuring fairly low latency, all in this sort of failure-free case. I haven't mentioned the word fails whatsoever. It turns out that, yes, if we do have failures, oh, if we do have failures here, then we will actually guarantee an always-on response. That is, by, by providing availability, that is number four here, we, in fact, get one through three as well. But it's not, this doesn't just apply to the failure setting. Okay? Now, though many of you are probably sitting in your, in your seats and saying, gosh, what about the CAP theorem? Right? How are we getting this coordination-free execution? And, and, and aren't there some trade-offs here that you're not telling you about? For those of you who aren't familiar with the CAP theorem, there's a very famous result from Eric Brewer, who's a professor at Berkeley and now is actually spending some time at Google. And Brewer, along with his students in the 1990s, worked on a search engine, one of the first large-scale search engines called Inktomy. Brewer and company realized that if you want to build a web-scale service, and this is one of the first web-scale services, you're going to have to make hard trade-offs if you want to make sure that, for instance, if one of your index servers is not down, users don't get a 404. In fact, Brewer and his, and his students realized that, in fact, if you want to build a large-scale service, you'll have to trade off between availability and always giving the right answer or the correct answer. In fact, there's a trade-off, and there's a very nice paper about har what's called harvest and yield. It's worth looking up if, if you haven't read this. That talks about trading off, for instance, querying all of your indexing servers versus querying those that are available at the time of query. If you want to get the absolute right answer, you'll need to... Um, wait, potentially, in the event of failures. The takeaway from the CAP theorem is fairly simple. It's that certain strong properties that make it easy to program distributed systems require unavailability, or in other words, require coordination. For instance, if I'm on replica one and you're on replica two, and we have a single replicated data item X, where X is zero, if we want to make sure that I see your rights, we'll have to be unavailable. Specifically, if you update x equals 1 on your replica, and I read from my replica, there's no way I can read your write unless if our replicas communicate. It's as simple as that. And in fact, for a fun afternoon read, I suggest you actually take a look at the, cap, the paper proving the CAP theorem from Nancy Lynch and Seth Gilbert that actually makes exactly this argument. It's very intuitive. We need to communicate if we need to share state. Now, this is sort of dismal. We, we had all these sort of nice properties we got from our coordination-free system. The question is, well, did any of that matter? If we have to give up on these nice properties, it seems like coordination-free system design is sort of hopeless. And in fact, this is a very common sort of incorrect conclusion that, that I see a lot when, we, when people talk about trade-offs between availability and consistency and so on. The, 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 the line goes something like, availability is too expensive. We have to give up all of these nice properties. It only matters during failures, so who cares? Well, it'd be sort of sad if that was the end of the story. And perhaps, surprising, perhaps surprisingly is that many guarantees that we actually depend on today in today's systems don't actually require giving up availability. In fact, if we treat this worst case systems analysis as a design tool, we end up expanding the space of algorithms and protocols we use to build these systems. Specifically, what we found in our research is that many legacy implementations of today's database systems in particular are designed for a single node context or a very tightly coupled cluster of servers. And they inherently use coordination. I'll go through an example in the next slide. 
So because of the way systems are built and have been built historically, they in fact use coordination. However, coming back to the theme of this talk, what's the worst that could happen? When we pose as a research question, what if we built systems that didn't have to coordinate, that weren't allowed to coordinate, right? By pushing open that spectrum within the space of possible distributed systems design, we found that in fact, in many cases, we can build designs that avoid coordination unless strictly necessary. And moreover, frequently, coordination-free implementations are actually possible. So let's go through a very simple example of how asking what's the worst that could happen? How can we build a system that under all scenarios guarantees a response for a very common semantics found in today's database systems? And the example I'll give is called read committed isolation. The fancy name for a very simple property, the slightly simplified goal, is that we'll never read uncommitted data. So if I write x equals 1, then x equals 2, you'll never read x equals 1. You'll only see the final value of my update. So this is a pretty useful property. It turns out about every database system today implements this guarantee. In fact, it dates back to 1976, when Jim Gray, who won the Turing Award for the development of the transaction concept, actually thought about what it meant to provide read committed. And in Gray's initial formulation, and in many since, he used coordination to implement this guarantee. Specifically, since 1976, most databases have implemented read committed by simply grabbing locks on records. So I want to update x, I grab a lock on x, I make my update x equals 1, make my second update x equals 2, and then I release my lock once I commit my transaction. Now this is correct. The problem is, as we saw earlier, holding those locks is fairly slow. On the single node systems Jim Gray was care cared about, basically uniprocessor single node, doesn't matter so much. The disk was the slow thing. Today, the network is the slow thing, and these types of implementations no longer scale. Coming back to our question, well, how can we build a system that didn't coordinate? And moreover, is coordination strictly necessary? Turns out, we might be able to do a little bit better. So, how we avoid coordinating using these locks? Well, one possibility, and there are several, is, for instance, to use multi-versioning. For example, if I have a private register, x prime, that I write to, instead of updating the primary copy of the database, I write x prime equals 1, x prime equals 2, and then once I commit my transaction, I copy x prime over to the real x, you'll never see my intermediate state. This is a very, very simple implementation. It's as, it's as simple as it sounds. In fact, there are more the more high-performance implementation of this that we can consider, but even this simple implementation can, order, can offer literally order of magnitude performance gains over these classic implementations, despite providing the exact same semantics, which is we'll never see this uncommitted uh, database state. So what this highlights, again, is that by focusing on this worst case, by asking how do we build systems that under no circumstances coordinate, we actually deliver a large number of benefits in practice. And accounting for this worst case in terms of network behavior actually ends up improving the average case in terms of performance and scalability of the systems when we deploy them. The punchline here is that in distributed systems design, systems that behave well during network faults can actually behave better during uh, cases where there are no failures in non-faulty environments as well. And with good designs, where we've explicitly accounted for the worst case, we've, we've built essentially systems from the ground up with the assumption that bad things are going to happen, we can in fact benefit legacy implementations. In fact, Martin Kleppman is going to have a talk on transactions, sort of myths, opportunities, and surprises tomorrow that I encourage you to check out, where I'll go into a little more detail about some of these topics. The research, both from my own group and from a large number of other groups, highlights that in fact when we take coordination-free execution as a first-class concern in our systems, in either at the language level, as Peter talked about this morning, in languages like Daedalus and Bloom, at the system level, as in some of our work on iConfluence and RAMP, or even at the data type level, in terms of sort of buzzwords you may have heard of, like CRDTs, we can frequently provide meaningful guarantees that occupy really a different corner of the design space than traditional systems thought of doing at all. So, I hope I've convinced you that distributed systems have a lot to benefit in terms of this worst-case thinking when we think about sort of what happens when networks are faulty and what happens when they're not. 
When I was preparing this talk, I was surprised to learn that there were a number of other situations under which this type of thinking can similarly benefit us. And I want to highlight a few sort of interesting examples that we came across when I polled some colleagues about, about instances where worst actually is best as well. The first of which is talking about replication for fault tolerance. So if I have a database system, for instance, or I have a stateful service, and I want to make sure that, for instance, when one of my instances goes down, I don't lose data, I very well might end up replicating uh, this service, right? So I might have multiple copies. By replicating, in order to not lose data, for many operations, I actually increase the capacity that my system can, can handle at any given time as well. For instance, if I have a primary backup replication scheme, I can sort of read only queries from my backups. Let's talk about another scenario. Typically, or I hope, in many of your deployments, failover is handled automatically. So for instance, if I have, again, again, a primary backup system here, I've got my primary highlighted in, in, in green. If I have sort of machinery to automatically fail over my primary, where when the primary goes down, I, I elect a secondary or I elect a replacement, then I can use the same failover mechanism for a bunch of cases that aren't failures at all. Simple example, let's say you want to upgrade your database from version 9 to version 9.2 of the software. If you didn't have automatic failover, you might turn off your front end server, services, go through each of your database servers and upgrade them, and then once you've made the upgrade, you turn back on your front ends and traffic resumes. You essentially have a global barrier and a lot of unavailability in order to perform essentially a routine software maintenance operation. In contrast, if you can fail over your servers, you can start killing them one by one. Kill a server, upgrade its software, turn it back on. If you have automated failover in your clusters, the nodes that when they're down will essentially have their uh, work migrated to other servers within the instance, or within the service. And in fact, this is a common strategy used in many cluster compute frameworks. For instance, when you have a slow node in something like Hadoop or Spark, you actually use the same, you can use conceptually the same rebalancing tools to migrate stateful tasks from one server to another. That'll improve the throughput, despite the fact there's no real failure, there's just some slowness on one or more of your nodes in your system. And in fact, if you're running a cluster manager like Mesos, where you want to, say, revoke resources that you've granted to a process, or alternatively, you tell your application team, sorry, we need to reprovision this node because a new service has higher priority, you don't actually have to go through the manual process of notifying them necessarily. You can just kill the node, revoke the resources, and continue on. So this mechanism that comes into play only when there are sort of rolling outages or when they, we actually have server failures, you can be exploited to your benefit when you're performing common operational roles. As a final example from computer science, let's talk about microservices. Microservices are very cool. Or, or, or if you're back in the you know, mid-2000s, you can talk about service-oriented architecture. Um, so, you know, if you care about your, if you think about a, a typical service, it can have some, some distribution of, of latencies. So in this service here, it's a, it's a fictional microservice, this is your service. Uh, let's say the 99.9th percentile latency is 100 milliseconds. So let's say 99.9% .9 of requests complete in one millisecond, and your 99.9th percent light, percentile latency, 99.9% .9 of your requests take 100 milliseconds. This leads to an average latency of 1.2 milliseconds. So this, this average is actually pretty good. The, the, the tail latency, not so good. So you might hack for a few weeks and say, well, gosh, how do I reduce GC stalls in this node, for instance? How do I bring that down? Let's say you get an order of magnitude improvement in your tail latency here. Under this distribution here, for your average latency, you'll see less than 10% uh, decrease in, 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 in latency. So really, you're putting, if you put in a lot of work, you get an order of magnitude reduction tail latency. You're really not seeing it in terms of most of your requests. However, this is just one service. And chances are, if you're running a service-oriented architecture, your service is part of a much larger patchwork of services that are essentially orchestrating the, 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 the runtime of a larger application. Specifically, right, you might be one of, say, hundreds of servers that are being queried at once in order to build a front-end sort of HTTP request. And if we imagine you have 100 of these servers here that are being queried by some front-end, then 
your tail latency is very likely to appear on average for every request. So the, front end, the average front end latency with 100x fan out for this distribution is around 64 milliseconds. In fact, if you, now in this case, if you were to do the same exact reduction, reduce your tail latency by a factor of 10, the front end average latency, which previously only reduced by less than 10%, reduce, you know, essentially sees a tenfold increase. What this demonstrates is that your service's corner case, in effect, may be the average case for the consumers of your service. And this is simply a matter of statistics. The more requests we draw from a distribution, the more likely we are to hit outliers in that distribution. Okay. So these examples are all other instances in sort of large-scale systems design. And it turned out, when I, when I talked to some colleagues from human-computer interaction, it turned out there's a very interesting application of sort of worst is best in what's known as universal design. So the, the idea behind universal design is very interesting. For those of you who don't know, this, is, this picture here is a, is a curb cut. It's essentially those things on the sidewalk where instead of having to step down six inches to get off of the sidewalk, you can essentially walk down a little ramp. So curb cuts were originally designed in order to help people in wheelchairs essentially not have to essentially hop six inches off the curb every time they wanted to get off and sort of wheel themselves up a, a six-inch wall in order to get onto the curb. Now, what happened when they designed these curb cuts for wheelchair users is that people like you and me, or, or those of us who aren't actually in wheelchairs, came to benefit as well. For instance, people riding bikes can use curb cuts. I use curb cuts when I cross the street as well. We don't have to necessarily step down six inches all the time. This is the classic instance of this design pattern of universal design, which essentially says by building systems that accommodate sort of everyone who might be using a sidewalk, we end up not benefiting not just those people for whom the system was, was originally designed, that is the, the wheelchair users, but in fact we benefit everyone else. Similarly, right, when I watch Netflix, I frequently turn on subtitles. And I'd imagine the number of people in the audience who turn on subtitles is much, much larger than the number of people who necessarily need subtitles in order to absorb the content. However, by reasoning about and building in different ways to absorb this video content, we actually improve the user experience for everyone. So this idea behind universal design is very important for essentially accessibility, but it has benefits that transcend simply the corner cases or the sort of the, the outliers in terms of the users who might actually access our services. For instance, the W3C makes a very interesting case that there's a strong business case behind accessibility. There is a close correlation between the design practices that improve accessibility and design practices that improve things like mobile web design, usability, and even things like SEO. So by handling sort of design for everyone, we in fact improve the experience for everyone. It's not simply that we're reasoning about outliers, it's that by, put it, by, by sort of changing by, by considering a larger scope of, of users, we end up improving the design experience for not just the people on the fringes, but for more or less everyone involved. One final example. It turns out that actually simply reasoning about best is not always best. So if we're trying to maximize some sort of function, as we might do in optimization here, we have x on the x-axis and f of x, which is cut off on the, on the y-axis, if we have some idealized function like this, it's very easy to choose sort of the optimal solution, right? We can, we can look here and say, okay, f of x is maximized at this point in the middle here. Now, this is an idealized function. What happens is that in the real world, functions aren't always so ideal. For instance, we have a function that looks like this, which is less well-behaved. We're very well going to have the same globally optimal point in the middle here, but, but only if we can very accurately choose the value of x. That is, this solution is fairly brittle, and that if we misestimate our parameters, we might very well miss the target and end up in a solution that's much worse, in fact, the worst possible point on the graph. Instead, what we might do is try to opt for what we call a stable or a robust solution. In fact, sometimes choosing the absolute best is not actually best, unless if we're extremely sure that we've hit the right mark on the x-axis. <laughs> 
And there's a whole body of uh, literature in the optimization space, if you're interested, called robust optimization that studies finding a stable solution. In fact, in real world optimization problems, for instance, trying to decide should we, uh, you know, how do we route, for instance, taxi cabs, or how should we deliver packages, very frequently we see functions that look like those on the right as opposed to those on the left. So I hope I've convinced you that designing for the worst case can, in fact, improve the average case. And I think there are some interesting opportunities to apply this type of thinking in your designs going forward as well. Specifically, this type of thinking right, doesn't always apply. As we saw at the start of the talk, there are a couple instances where thinking about the absolute worst case was not a good thing. However, in your applications, if corner cases are fairly common or similarly are unpredictable, it might be worth thinking about what the worst case uh, means for your operating uh, environment and what it means for your application when things you didn't think were going to go wrong did go wrong. You know, in a nutshell, maybe this is a bit tautological, but really, when normal isn't what we think, thinking about the worst case is a remarkably powerful tool because the way we define normal in terms of our designs, the way in which we say this is expected and this is unexpected, ends up having a profound impact on the way in which we build systems. In fact, simply going through the exercise of asking what is the worst thing that, that could happen can be very instructive in helping us find points in the design space we might have not otherwise have thought about. We might not otherwise have curb cuts. We, we might not otherwise have thought about, gosh, what happens if we build systems that never have to talk? It sounds ridiculous, and yet somehow, in terms of combating you know, the cognitive processes in our minds, it's very helpful and pushes us towards new spaces in the design space. Going back to our early examples, right, we saw that, for instance, in cluster provisioning, it was ridiculous to, to try to provision a cluster for 7 billion users. But if we ask this question, you know, well, we might not need to worry about the 7.3 billion users, we might need to answer questions like, what's our, what's our strategy for scale out? How far can we actually scale our services before we need to, for instance, buy a new data center, or switch EC2 instance types, or move to multiple availability zones? This sort of worst case thinking puts us on, on, on a trajectory that we should maybe not go to the far you know, logical you know, extremes of the conclusion, but we can kind of think, well, gosh, what happens between here and 7.3 billion users? Similarly, in, in terms of hardware, yeah, we probably won't be sending MacBooks to Mars anytime soon, but it is useful for us to ask questions like, what happens if we have bit flips in our hardware? Right? Do we need to pay for things like ECC? Where is the right point in that trade-off space? And have we actually chosen the right set of sort of worst case scenarios that we're willing to pay for? In terms of security, sure, yeah, most likely all of our developers aren't trying to compromise our data. But we should probably have a strategy in, pl in place that allows us to manage or audit internal data accesses. So by thinking about these extreme cases, we in fact make sure that we have drawn the boundaries in the right place. Every system has to draw some kind of boundary. It's unlikely that in, for all cases, we'll be able to build systems that handle every worst case scenario. But knowing which scenarios we care about and which scenarios we've opted to not sort of accommodate is extremely important. I think at a very, very high level, thinking about the worst case is a very important tool for essentially examining your biases when you're building software and you're building systems. Who is this software designed for? What environment do we expect this to be running in? And what happens if, I, if we're wrong? So in conclusion, reasoning out worst case scenarios can be a very powerful design tool. This has been really key in some of our research on coordination avoiding database system designs. In fact, this can improve performance and robustness for a number of other scenarios, in addition to sort of combating biases we run into when we build and operate software in practice. So I'm Peter Bayless. There are a number of people who helped out with this talk, uh, who I really appreciate, who gave some of the later examples. And I'd love to take any questions. Thanks for your time.